Hello and welcome to Prime Lenses. I'm Ian. Each week I speak to a photographer about three lenses that have meant something to them on their photographic journey. It's unashamedly gear chat, but hopefully focused more on the images made with that gear than performance metrics and graphs. My guest today is Emily Lowry, a photographer and YouTuber whose career as a content creator has seen her focus on the Micro Four Thirds systems uh, and small cameras. But she's shot professionally, weddings and all sorts of corporate events and continues to do so, whilst also bringing her audience a perspective on photography that focuses very much on making and making the most of your camera system. She travels a lot, tends to love a simple, small setup, uh, you know, she tries and tests stuff in a way that I really appreciate. And recently she's been dabbling in film, even though it is eye-wateringly expensive. Her preference for kind of small and kind of kooky, interesting setups meant I thought we'd probably get on really well, uh, but I didn't realise how well until we briefly touched on the topic of which is the best Star Trek. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Emily. You know? Give me two minutes to clean sure. up the mess it's just been There's... a dumping ground this month because i've had that many things coming in and such quick turnarounds it's just oh yeah i mean this terrible. is audio only i'm not going to use the video this is just <gasps> oh, so amazing. we can see each other oh this brilliant. is just so i can sort case, of wave at you yeah enjoy my mess <laughs> <laughs> i will so right. this is radio i can st i can start the episode by going emily your office space looks incredible it's so tidy it's fantastic <laughs> i love it I perfect and everything <laughs> the lighting's perfect it's like looking into a leica store showroom it's yep. just this is like looking into my brain at the moment I'm just, <laughs> oh, yeah it's pretty good you've got a pikachu and an enterprise in the background uh, it feels yes. pretty good yeah it's yeah. Uh, my, my husband's desk has all the silly stuff um and all How the convenient. star trek mm -hmm. uh, spaceships which is great i like star yeah. trek too sure no, I mean, I just recently discovered um, Strange New Worlds uh, oh, so this good. year. It's so good. It's Why is the incredible. world not talking about Strange New Worlds? It's fantastic. I just watched the musical episode. Oh, my God. I mean, how just on earth? brilliant. I love that Like, it's like older Trek where you do have stupid, crazy episodes and it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's just amazing. Yeah. Mm. I've watched yeah. the first two seasons with uh, twice through because I have to watch it with my dad because he's he, he only ever gets a chance to watch it when he's with me because he doesn't have any streaming mm. stuff. So we'll be watching season three when we go to the Faroe Islands, I imagine, at the end of the yeah. month. Yeah, I can't wait for the next season. It's tremendous. I've, I've absolutely loved it. And yeah, all the right combination of feels and everything. Mm -hmm. I love I love Captain Pike. I think what an he's amazing Star Trek captain. He's, he's really so good. good. And he's Una. Really good. Everyone's yep. so good. Yeah, no, they are all brilliant. Should we just start um, a podcast yeah. about Star Trek? I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'll just start a, a, a competitor to the greatest generation and just see what happens. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really excited to talk to you because I, I know nothing about Micro Four Thirds. I don't know the Panasonic line very well at all. And this podcast was in danger of becoming a Leica and Polaroid podcast. <laughs> so talking to you, talking to Ali, talking to anyone I can get my hands on who's just got a bit of a different perspective is really cool because I saw your video of Japan and you've been shooting film like 2024 seems like an insanely busy year for you yeah I've just been trying as many different things as possible and then the day after I got home from Japan um a, a GH7 landed on my door um, of course. so it's just like yeah no non-stop <laughs> non-stop at the moment but then there are months where there is just nothing going on so you've just got to take the opportunities when they come I guess yeah. How do you kind of, do you, do you have a schedule that you follow? Do you just produce the video and it's ready when it's ready? So when it's like the GH7, I have a specific uh, embargo day and it was 10 mm. p.m. last night to, to be in line with um, the Cinegear announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, but for my own schedule, it's usually uh, every Tuesday at right. 3 p.m. or if I'm running late, Thursday. That right. you'll, if, if, a, if a video's going out on Thursday, I've had a bad week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the previous guests on the show um dave herring his thing is i post two videos a week in set unless something has gone terribly wrong <laughs> you're like oh no that's i mean but that's that's a to just to let everyone know i think like just so you know yeah but that's really cool um what are you still film experimenting because i the last videos of yours i was watching when i was, I was i like to do a bit of a deep dive and look into people's stuff it seemed like you were having tons of fun but it's also the eye-watering expense and yeah. time 
Yeah, I've gone deeper into the rabbit hole since that video, and I've now right. got the chemicals to uh, develop my own film. Oh, and get I've, out of I've town. got a really nice um, sort of 3D printed thing that converts like a macro lens into like a, a, a scanner for the negatives. Mm. So if, if I can figure all that out, it should bring the cost down. Right. Uh, time commitment goes up, but I think it'll be a fun video, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It got to feed the content machine, but it, uh, the time is is relative because I, I that's why I love instant film, right? Is that it's it's still a magic trick, even if it's Polaroid and it takes fifteen minutes. At least you've got something, and then you know you can hand the thing to people, and that's a really lovely feeling as well. Like having a thing, I I do t sometimes shoot film, but I just don't feel like I can really go back. Yeah, you know, like it's it's too convenient getting the file straight away, and I think. This is where the kind of to go full circle, I guess, this is where this whole set of conversations came from is a, is a kind of obsession with lenses and the fact that the lens has so much impact now, unless you have an S9 with LUTs for days <laughs> and that changes, that changes everything. You seemed very enamored with the, um, the kind of the LUTs and the setup stuff, especially when you jumped in at the end of your video and were like, I've just edited the whole thing. And oh, it's so good. So comparing it to when i went for the s5 II launch when you get a camera that isn't out yet you can't access mm. the raw files yeah. so the workflow was so different i had to use a program called silky pics and convert them all into tiff and it was mm. crashing my computer and the whole process of editing the the s5 II raws was sort of like a week's worth of work to get it for the video mm. whereas with the s9 it was literally okay i need to straighten that one fine 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 and i just edited them all in like 20 yeah. minutes and i'm just like this is so cool obviously you know you do want to deep dive into the rows at some point so i can't wait to mm. to get to grips with that but just for having something usable and that looks quite nice and importantly in my own style as well because it was my mm. looks worth its yeah. weight in gold i think it's going to be it's an underrated feature i think i it's actually interesting to talk to you about style and things establishing your own i i struggle with color i think and i think of, and, and like having a a look and I kind of flip flop between being stressed that I don't have a look and then thinking I do have a look and I just use mostly what comes out of the camera and it's fine. Like I picked my camera body because I like what it made. How do you choose? Because I think I'd have decision paralysis around those kind of looks. <laughs> So I, I think this stems from desperately wanting consistency from when I was doing wedding photography full time. I was doing that for sort of 12 years full time. And you do want to have a specific look and you want every photograph to look very similar so that if someone's on the Instagram feed, they go, oh, that's Emily Lowry. Let's look at that. Um, so I, I have um, I've worked. I'm, I'm, I'm an absolute editing nerd. I've got these three packs. Um, one's great for skin tones. One's great for street photography and one's better for landscape and animals. And I just use variations of all of them all the time. Yeah. yeah. And, and I feel like they all look semi cohesive, even though they do go off in different directions. Mm. I can totally appreciate that someone is coming to you because Emily makes things like that and they, you know, so the S9 makes all the sense in all the world, you know, exactly. in that scenario. Yeah if, yeah, if you've got one specific sort of look that you want to replicate and you know it looks great for street photography at night, for example, mm. it's yeah. done. All done. Yeah. Oh, really nice. No, it's really good. Well, what are you what are you sort of everyday shooting with at the moment then? Because do you have an S9 or do you have to kind of like loan that and give it back? Because when I used to review video games and video game hardware back in the day. And so some of that you would have to give back and some of that you would get to keep. But a camera is a bit of a different prospect in terms of price point from them. So I don't know whether you like, there might be a select few of you who get to keep that stuff. Do you have to hand that back or do you have an S9 now or, you know? Yeah, so it's it's on a long-term loan from nice. Lumix. Mm -hmm. um, it, as in, you know, I can't spray paint it like I have sure. done with some of my other cameras in case they do ever want to bring <laughs> it back and, and sort of send it to another person to review. Yeah. Um, but it is different from camera to camera. So for instance, mm. the GH7 I got on the 30th of May and mm. now it's going back tomorrow. Right. So it's like, bye bye, on to yeah. the next review. Embargo happens, has to Exit. go off to the next bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I shed a little tear when I put it back in the, back in the box. Uh, but as far as I know, the S S9 should be on a long term loan. So I can definitely create some more content with that. Oh, nice. And have you found that people are, because is that in people's hands yet? So presumably you, you talked about your LUTs and stuff like that that you sell. Do you, do you see a spike in interest in the kind of preset LUT stuff when things yeah. like this come out? 
I, I do. I was really blown away by it, actually. From my review video from the S9, I was just showcasing um, my streetwise uh, lot that was on all of my photos. And yeah, a, a lot of people went to my website and, and bought the, the presets on the back of that, maybe in preparation for them getting an S9, or mm. they work in Lightroom as well. Maybe they just like the look of it, which is quite flattering. <laughs> Yeah, that's really good. Do you think how like how many of those do you make? Do you do you have a plan to like make more? Is there like a plan as part of the content stuff? Do you have like your grand Emily board with red bits of string and here's the year <laughs> plan and all the products I'm going to release, or do you kind of like find it as it comes? Oh, so for my presets is those three packs. I sell all three on my website and I've used them extensively for years and years and years and tweaked them over the years. And that's what I continue to use for a long time to come. So unless yeah. I'm, I was very tempted to bring out um, a, a safari pack when I went to Kenya yeah. last September because it mm. was tweaking to get sort of the, the, the tones of like lion's fur, for example, isn't yeah. something that is very easily done in, in an average preset. Uh, but mm. no, I'll just, I just think keeping it the same and, and showing people that I use it every single day gives yeah. them faith in it as well, I think. Um, yeah. In terms of the roadmap, I'm trying to get some workshops done. I get so many questions about editing and composition, and I just don't think YouTube is the right place mm. for that sometimes because tutorial videos tend to tank. Gear videos do very well. Mm. <laughs> so if I can find a space on my website for some workshops, then people can check those out as well. Yeah, no, it's nice. I think gear chat in general, it's funny. Everyone, everyone sort of pretends to hate gear chat, but then you get into a bit of gear chat. And it's it's been brilliant sort of... Um, I've been able to say to my wife, like, oh, this person said yes, and this person said yes, and, blah, blah, blah. and she's like, why are they saying yes? And I think some of it is that just everyone fan you know, fancies a bit of a gear chat. Like, so it's true. quite nice. It's quite nice to sit down with people and go, what do you use? I use one of these. Uh, I think the king of lenses is a 35 f28 Zeiss. <laughs> uh. But yeah, so presets and things, this is kind of a nice way of getting into it, I suppose. Presets and things is kind of like Emily now. Take us back to like, what put a camera in your hands in the first place? And then actually what's interesting is you've made a big deal out of like the small micro four thirds, like you're a real champion of that format and just the, that ecosystem so big and vibrant and gets forgotten sometimes in the face of like everything's got to be full frame. So talk us through the beginning and what got you on this path. So photography to begin with, I sort of stumbled into photography as a little bit of a comfort blanket. I used to be cripplingly shy. People don't believe me when I say this. I'm quite extrovert nowadays, but I was like, if there was a family gathering or something like that, I would be hidden away. And the way that I would interact with people and, and have a little bit of a social buffer is, is taking photographs and then I could give them at, at the end. And, you know, that was my way of interacting mm. with friends and family yeah. when I was very, very shy. In terms of moving into Micro Four Thirds, I fell in love with the look and the aesthetic of the Olympus Pen F and just thought, my goodness, the lens is a tiny, this is yeah. so nice. And going back to like my, my anxiety phase, having a camera with me every day was very important. So I think I was like the everyday carry person before it became a thing. <laughs> it was my comfort blanket. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> and I came from Sony full frame and I was just absolutely astounded at the quality versus the size. I was just like, what? Why do no people, why does no one talk about this? So I started my YouTube channel about my transition from going from Sony full frame into micro four thirds. And then as I found Lumix cameras and different Olympus cameras, yeah, the rest is history. Became obsessed and a collector. How big's the collection now? <laughs> Um, I think my last count before I went to Japan and bought four more was 37 <laughs> digital cameras, <laughs> which is a bad. Awesome. I bet Ali's got a bigger co collection than me. Oh, sure. One but hundo. She's, she's a monster. Like she she's and I amazing. have talked about this. No, she is. She's fantastic. And I, I love talking to her about stuff. She, she cannot fully, under I think she admires, but is baffled by my one camera rule. You know, like my, because I have the, it's bad enough with lenses, right? I have a bit of lens and lens anxiety, like the, this 35 F 28 that is on the front of my camera right now basically lives there. And, um, it's, it's stressful enough going, am I using the 50 enough? Am I using my, you know, when did I last use the 90? When did, yeah. you know, I've got a, I've got a 135 over there that comes out like when the flying Scotsman is in town, like, and that's <laughs> basically, and then goes back in its back in its bag for whenever but i think that's kind of the curse so if i had that and then i had multiple systems like even if i just had like a monochrome body or an older body for the vibes 
right? Like a, an M9 or an M8 or something like that. And I can just kid myself and go, oh, it's all right. It's all the same glass. Um, yeah, I think I'd find it stressful. I think I'd feel like I was um, stressed by carrying the wrong thing somehow or, you know, because it takes away choice. That's the mm. problem. The problem is choice. I've got this now with the Polaroids where I've got the I2 and I've got a 680 and the, the I2 is just better really like in every way unfortunately like it's it's you know as much as the 680 is incredible poppy whatever the i2 is just a better thing but i can't quite bring myself to get rid of the 680 it's like it, but it probably should go somewhere it's it's like indiana jones it belongs in a museum you know? <laughs> that's my thing every time i've sold something i've always at some point ended up regretting it so mm. it sort of turned me into a little bit of a camera hoarder yeah um yeah that's a good point so that i think it comes from that as well but also i do think you get like a different affinity with different little cameras particularly the small ones because they have so much more character in the jpeg and mm. and you know the way that they work and the quirks yep. as i like to call it not not crippling flaws it's always fun <laughs> <laughs> that's spoken by a true like a true addict that is it's like it's not a it's not a bug it's a feature it's a feature like the olympus pl6 can have time lapses but it can only shoot 99 images which gives you about a second and a half name me a more useless feature than that <laughs> you just have to kind of like really spread each frame out yeah <laughs> yeah quirks oh, i like the quirks i do yeah i liked your one what was that old camera you were playing with uh the other in one of your recent videos it was a really old one it was like two megapixels or something oh yeah the uh the olympus comedia series oh so charming just little noises when it turns on yeah. it takes like half a second or a second and a half or something stupid mm -hmm. before it even takes a photo so i was yeah. trying to take photos of skateboarders and they'd gone <laughs> yes <laughs> it was yeah. great uh, but yeah taking things back to basics where you know if you clip the highlights it's game over if mm -hmm. you are, you know, if you don't have your settings bang on, it's kind of like film in a in a way mm -hmm. where it keeps you on your toes as a photographer, and yeah. it's super fun for like very little price. I think that was about twenty pounds off eBay, and I had yeah. a great time with it. Yeah, no, if it, if it's if it's a good time, I think most cameras are a good time. I think that's the problem is that we will always have fun with them, and then it's just a question of like where do you keep it? Like my friend gave me a Nikon that he had from way back when that he spent thousands on in like 1996 and now is probably worth about a fiver but he found it in a cupboard and it had a compact flash card in it which had pictures from my 21st birthday which you can tell from my hair color was a while ago and so it was just funny to kind of like turn this thing on and try and navigate menus and i was like what an absolute nightmare this thing is like to yeah. actually use these days you know it's just it's crackers yeah, one thing I like about the older technology and, and film photography in general is it makes you feel like a complete noob again. You yeah. know, you do have to know your exposure triangle. You do have to know your manual settings without thinking. And yeah. I'm, I'm a sucker for just sticking something in shutter speed priority and letting the camera deal with it. So yeah. it's nice to know that I still have the fundamentals when I take older kit out. Yeah, no, it's, it's, the, uh, it's like the bit in the movie where someone comes out of retirement. Yeah, Emily comes out of retirement, grizzled war hero. She's like, okay, I'll do this one more time. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Exactly. Oh, nice. Well, when you're not shooting with that stuff, then as a segue onto your maybe your first lens choice mm. for today, do you want to tell people listening what your first one of your three is? Because it's not quite as vintage as a no. two megapixel. <laughs> but my my most uh favorite one of my favorite wide angle lenses in the micro four thirds system is the olympus 9 to 18 and it is plastic fantastic it's very very small it's very very light but my goodness the photos are so so sharp and if you pair that with a small enough camera body it's just mm. incredible yeah it's yeah. my it's my favorite wide angle lens on the micro four thirds system i think how many bodies have you got you can use that with then because there's that with uh, the where's the choice like where's the sweet spot so i've got maybe 20 micro four thirds cameras mm -hmm. um over olympus and micro four thirds and it's great i love it for walking and hiking i took mm -hmm. it um to um zion national park and did at angels landing and just having a lens that weighs nothing on a camera body that weighs nothing that every little helps when i'm hiking to be honest i, I couldn't think about carrying a proper camera up somewhere <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is the thing with like my M. Like I got the M, the newer one that's lighter, and it it does make a massive difference. Like if you get to the end of the day and you're just not 
weighed down by this thing it also means you'll take it places exactly if, you know rather than like right okay or or the weight saving offsets like offsets the weight of an old lens like then i yes. can justify my vintage one or yes and know. one thing that i i rave about in the micro four thirds community is because the lenses are so small you can have a just in case lens and you may never right. consider taking out a wide angle lens because they're usually a larger and heavier but mm -hmm. if you can get one that's sort of tiny and, and really really light you can stick it in your bag or even your handbag if you're yeah. going out minimal and you've got lens choices without adding any extra weight to your overall kit and i find that very appealing yeah that's no, really good I, I was trying to advise my sister-in-law recently because she wanted to get a camera and we were looking at four thirds systems in the end we went with the nikon one because there's mm. kind of a there's a kind of nice um they're available they tend to come together as a kit they tend to have been kept quite nicely they're not um they're not very heavy they're very, you know they're, they're really small there's a good price point to kind of performance thing there the autofocus is ridiculous for some reason it was like nikon really focused on that like it's really good autofocus speed but what if there's if there's someone listening now who fancies like a small setup as a kind of travel one and i'm thinking to be honest a bit about my stepdad who's been wrestling with this a little bit like wants a really small travel camera but values interchangeable lenses is there a body that you tend to point people towards as a as a kind of good go-to yeah so if um ha having an electronic viewfinder is um a deal breaker then the mm. g100 is right. a really nice sort of fo don't use it for video it's not great for video but it's really really mm. good for photo um it has the newer 20 megapixel uh, micro four thirds sensor it has a nice grip it has an evf it has a flippy screen mm. and it, you know it's very very light it is a plastic uh, it's a more plastic build quality quirk yeah a quirk feature <laughs> feature not bug you not a bug it's a feature because it's very light it's not a yeah. bug because it's very fragile <laughs> mm. but no it's yeah. a very very good camera um and the one that i tend to talk about a lot to the point where i think i've dried up the used market in entirely is the right. the, the lumix gx 800 right. um which you can get for 200 300 pounds at the mm. absolute most comes in fun colors has wi-fi yeah. features interchangeable lenses flippy screen time lapse features everything you need you more than 90 more than 90 unlimited on lumix because they're not insane <laughs> but yeah i just i'm always astounded by the spec that you can get for the price with older cameras and it shoots raw you can get amazing photographs out of it and i always say you don't have to spend the earth if you want to get into photography it's more important to get out there and start learning about the things that matter like composition and training your eye and learning your settings mm. yeah definitely there's um john who i had on recently was talking about just holding his camera a lot of the time and it's like taking your rifle apart and putting it back together with a blindfold on like just yeah. knowing where all the buttons are knowing how to drive the thing just makes all the difference because then it means when you're there in the moment and you do want that photo of a skateboarder you're ready you know you're like i've trained for this i don't know why every reference i'm making is a military one i think it's because we started talking about star trek at the beginning maybe or something and that's it's in no, my mind now. i'm all here for it i had a similar sort of um learning curve i was reviewing the fujifilm x105 recently and because mm. the shutter speed is is a dial on the top when i did need to sort of quickly sort of ramp up the shutter speed i was like ah where is it at the top you know yeah whereas i'm so used to it just being on a back dial um, yeah. So yeah, there, it is just knowing where everything is inside out that is more important than hopping around and thinking that throwing money at the problem will solve it. Yeah, no, definitely. That's the other reason I admire those of you who move from system to system so often. Because again, like I need to know kind of what I'm doing. And so I need to know like which, just where everything is, where I left it effectively. Whereas if, you know, if you, I think you're definitely the same, right? Someone hands you a camera, even if you've not used it before, you've got your basics down so you can drive it but if i was moving camera bodies every like 12 months danny who was the first guest on this show i can't keep up with how often he changes cameras <laughs> but i just i just can't keep up with it like he's when i've i mean you think i started doing this what like 12 12 weeks ago 13 weeks ago something like that in that time that man has sold purchased and i think sold again a q of various types <laughs> whether it was a q or a q3 or whatever. and it's like I cannot keep up, Danny. Like, I, your camera bag is just too volatile. Um, but all power to you. Yeah. Um, but he, he likes those older ones. 
yeah I think there's um there's two sort of factions of photographers and there is an overlap and I think I'm more or less in the middle where it's like mm. the people like you who just want to go out and the photography is the thing yeah. and then there's people that get a real affinity with the technology and and the, the cameras that they use inspire them yeah and it, as long as you do both it's okay I just think if you are the person that buys the tech and doesn't get out and use it that's when it's not the right solution yeah yeah, no, completely. And uh, do you know what's funny is like, I do have a one camera rule, but you'll notice I've started a reason to have conversations with people about different gear because I still <laughs> want to feed that need. Yeah. You know, if you if you have a dream in which Jason Momoa shows you his lens collection, then you make the podcast off the back Absolutely. of it. Like, that's just, you know, yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's such a stupid origin story. I like to say it out loud a lot in the hopes that one day it manifests, you know, Manifest who knows? That. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't it be brilliant? Can you just imagine talking to Aquaman about lenses? It'd be so cool. Yeah, I reckon he would be very enthusiastic. <gasps> yes, no, for sure. The most, I think the most enthusiastic. <laughs> I think that, that, that seems to be his brand from what I've seen. Have you seen the Guinness advert he made? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So Absolutely good. brilliant. It's like it's he's a, like one percent Irish. It's so good. It's like one of the extras in it is more and more. He's also yeah. Like, oh it's yeah. Such a good video. I think it's very much a family affair with him. Like I think I think he's like the rising tide will raise all boats, but first off, it's going to raise the boats near me, and just because that's a nice way to do things. And I think I think people who do that sort of thing keep family really close. It probably stops them being some sort of horrible media monster. Like, because I suspect there comes a point when you've, I don't know, been in Game of Thrones and been Aquaman that maybe the people around you, you know, you need to make sure they're good people because otherwise it could go wrong, you know, <laughs> and there's there's no shortage of like versions of that story, I think, where it's gone really wrong. Thankfully, so you and I, I don't think going to be burdened with, with those sorts of challenges somehow. <laughs> like, I can't see myself uh, having to like say yes or no to a movie at a certain point in the future. No, I think, I think no. we'll be safe from the Aquaman curse. <laughs> Exactly. If indeed it is a curse. But yeah. Okay. So that was like lens one and a segue into into small bodies. If you had to choose another lens and you kind of do this, by the way, I feel a bit out of practice on the saying the lenses because you're the, like a lot of people recently have been changing the rules up and breaking mm. the rules a little bit. So it's quite nice to talk to someone who's just prepared. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just like, I've got three lenses. We're going back to basics here. Here's where they are. So what's your number two? So number two is a lens that I recently bought in the last 12 months for my trip to Kenya. And it's the Olympus 45 to 150 millimeter f2.8. Ian from the future here with a quick note just to say, Emily messaged me to say this is of course a 40 to 150 millimeter lens, not a 45. So mm -hmm. it's a decent sort of zoom lens in full frame terms if you double the focal length. Mm -hmm. and. The reason that I think it's just brilliant is it's 2.8 constant all the way through. It's very, mm -hmm. very light and it's just ridiculously sharp, ridiculously mm. sharp. You know, you can you can crop s straight into sort of all the details on like the elephant skin, for example. It's absolutely brilliant. Mm. And one thing when I was on safari was I didn't realize how close to the animals you would get. So I had like right. a 100 to 400 thinking I'd be using that all the time. And I actually ended up using this 45 to 150 a heck of a lot more because they weren't shy. <laughs> no, they just, I guess they must just see humans all the time and yeah. know that they're not generally a threat. Wow. That's really cool. What was it? You mentioned elephants and lions. What was your favorite thing to see? Oh, right. We saw, um, we just were about to get kicked out of one of the national parks because a big storm was rolling in. And mm. just as we were losing light, I saw we saw a mummy leopard with four cubs and they came out of the hide and just started harassing her. Oh, and, wow. oh, it was the best experience to see that. And just to be able to see that before everyone had to leave as well, it was so lucky. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. How long were you out there for in total then? Uh, just two weeks, but it was a very full-on two weeks. We yeah. did um, Nairobi, Amboseli, and the Masai Mara. Two weeks is a long time. I always feel like 10 days is the sweet spot mm. for like being away. Like After 10 days, you're like, I, I could be back home now. I'm all right. <laughs> Like, you know, I never like, get that feeling. I'm, like, I'm off. No, I'm off. More things, please. <laughs> yes, more things. I was uh, So a couple of years ago, I was in Kuala Lumpur because we've got a studio out there for the company I work for. And yeah, that was two weeks. We're out for that. And, and you got past the first weekend and you, it's, it felt started to feel slightly confusing because it was like, do I live here now? Or do I, like, I feel, felt a bit like Bill Murray 
uh, in Lost in Translation. I'm sort of I'm living in a hotel, and yeah, it's, it's, it all starts to feel a bit unreal. You know, yeah. everything's just everything's just very easy when you're traveling as well. Like you're everything's sorted out for you. You Just go places. You don't have to cook things. You don't have to worry about washing or washing up. Or it's so know. good. It's the best. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you come down on it's the best side then. Oh yeah, like all of my spare cash just goes to where can we go next? Yeah, so as, as long as I can make videos when I'm out and work away, it's all expensive. Yay! Ah, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a full time gig for you, isn't it? Now I guess, it like is, you're yes. making everything. For do you still sins. do stuff like weddings and things like that, or do you are you full time kind of media produ production stuff? So I've got literally one more wedding left in the books. It's just a friend of a friend I've said that I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to do it for. Um, but yes, I, I, it's always in the back pocket in case everything mm -hmm. goes horrifically wrong. Um, but yeah, at the moment, really happy to just be concentrating on, on YouTube and, and doing the content creation full time. Yeah. What do you think of the, the the kind of the where we find ourselves now and kind of like the end of the social web as we knew it? Like YouTube, I heard Neil Patel at The Verge talk about this, is like all this regulation is coming for Facebook and X or Twitter or whatever it's called this week and all, all you know, Instagram and all that sort of stuff. He said, but YouTube just seems to be accepted that like it's like the ocean. It is just there. And no one seems to be kind of like, even though it's maybe just as much of a monopoly as the other things. Like how do you think about building a business on other people's business models? knowing that they can just change the rules whenever they feel like it. Yeah, I think it's quite scary. I think YouTube is by far the best place for creators to go in terms of longevity for their content. A lot of my viewers might watch something that's six months old, for example, mm. whereas if you are putting posts on Instagram, it feels like the next day it's old news and no one sees it ever yeah. again. Yeah. Um, but I do think it is a little bit scary, which is why this year I've really concentrated on building my mailing list and my website. Um, just mm. so I've got direct contact contact with people that yes. you know watch my stuff. Yeah, you start to build that thing. The it was the founder of Wired, wasn't it? Who talked about a thousand fans. That's mm -hmm. all you need. Um, and now, in fact, there's a really good talk. I will. I don't know if you've seen it uh, by the guy that founded Patreon, Jack, mm. whatever his name is, the Pample Moose guy. Yeah, he's and it was just cool. great. Yeah, brilliant. And just seeing him recount that story of like 2011 onwards, and you know years and years of playing gigs to empty rooms and then suddenly youtube arrives and it's this whole new thing and you start to build a direct relationship with an audience and that whole thing seemed like a roller coaster and so uh, you know he his, his big takeaway message is like we can build a structure that supports creative people and them getting paid directly by people who want to consume that content but we have to support it as a you have to build it to do that you can't just hope yeah. that that happens and the al algorithmic approach kind of has failed creators a little bit to some extent it's sort of you know like you said the new stuff takes over or popular stuff you never get to see stuff that isn't popular yeah so how can yeah. it become popular exactly you know? and i do think it does lend people jumping on trends a lot more because almost sometimes you do feel like you have to play the algorithm game i just want to go out and take photos and be a nerd and talk about yes. tiny cameras and sometimes you do feel like you need to be like this is going to change everything. Dun, dun, dun. I'm like, no, it's a 200 quick camera. <laughs> this is yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> this 200. But, but that's the other thing. Like I've seen your videos and I've seen George and Ali's videos and I go back to them and I'm like, oh, that looks like a cool camera. And then I look it up on eBay and I'm always too late. Like yeah. there's always, there's always someone has got a sniff of it immediately. And sometimes it's more just suddenly it's, it's shot up in cost. You hit a milestone this week though, which we should probably I did, yeah. celebrate. Yeah, I, I hit 60,000 subscribers. Woo! Da, 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 da. It only took me seven years. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> nice. Well, you see, you say that. You see, some, some of us have got a newsletter with 32 subscribers right now. So that's, that's incredible. Good. That's so good. <laughs> it's all right. I'll take it. I just like, I, I think, because also, because we're doing this for fun. Right. Like I've said on previous episodes, I'm not actually looking at the numbers. Um, the newsletter one just is in front of me because every time I go and write a newsletter, it tells me how many people it's going to. So I can't avoid that one. But all of the other ones I will happily avoid because I think it will change the conversation too much. It'll influence it. I'll start worrying about, you know, talking about posters in the background or dogs or, or fear that I've got to put video in yeah. just because video, you know, content video is king, man. Like everybody needs videos. It's like, what if I just did talking to people about cameras and see what happens? Yeah. And, and you know, that mailing list uh, number is incredible because I, I truly believe that mailing list subscribers are 
more your true like sort of followers or fans or whatever you'd want to call it mm, yeah. um i i only started my mailing list on christmas day oh and nice. I've, I've got three thousand two hundred. so i've got a baby mailing amazing. list but i'm getting there it's slow and steady yeah. yeah no that's really good and i think you're absolutely right if you've got those people to talk to then when you're like hey i've tweaked these i've tweaked these presets i've tweaked these things like if you want to learn things or whatever or you want to come to my workshop then it just means you've got those people you can go and approach and then it'll take you ages to do workshops with three thousand people well that's yeah. that's years worth of work just talking those guys through it if you ever do one on color and establishing your own look please let me know because i that's that's i think where my that's the bit of my brain that just doesn't work. I've, I've only just unlocked, I don't know if you've read it, Joel Meyerowitz's book, uh, A Question of Colour. No, but it sounds interesting. I'm a, it's I, really, I really good. It. Yeah, so it's really good. I mean, it's on, you pick up a used copy or whatever, like I did on Amazon, it's like 10 quid or something. But basically what he did, he, um, when he was first shooting, the guy in the shop said black and white or colour for film. And he was like, oh, don't really know, because he was just starting out. And... At a certain point, he was like enjoying black and white, but also enjoying color, and he didn't really know which way to go. So what he did, because he's a madman and it's brilliant, he had two bodies, one with color, one with black and white, and he would, as close as possible, take the same shot with both cameras and then look at them afterwards to try and make up his mind as to which one he wanted to go down. And what's brilliant about the book, it's, I don't know if you know anyone who's ever read the, um, the Alan Carr book on quitting smoking, but... So interesting book. I've never read it because I never smoked. But when you read it, he says, don't quit smoking while you're reading the book. And then there will just come a point when you'll stop. Right. Right. And this book is almost like that, but for color on black and white. Like there comes a point in the book where I was, I was sitting on a plane reading it and I was just like, this just makes sense. Why, why am I ever shooting black and white? And I love black and white photography, but it's really kind of changed something in my brain just around color and just thinking about color. And so it's, I think books like that, like books have got to be the thing a lot of the time, I think, as you're trying to develop your photography, like, because it just feeds the part of your brain, I think, that, that you know, kind of, what do you get your inspiration and in feeding like that sort of stuff from books or from Instagram or like, where do you find your inputs to your processes? I'm really enjoying picking up um like zines and things at the moment from from fellow photographers when i was in um tokyo with blue mix i went to um roman fox's exhibit about street photography in in tokyo and i met loads of cool photographers in there it wasn't just him it was like an exhibit of loads of, of different uh, people and it was so inspiring some people were I loved how you could see the same place in so many different mm. uh, angles. Like there's some people that were doing long exposures with just black and white. And then there were some people that were really leaning into the neon and the color. And I bought that magazine and I've just been flipping through it and going, I've got so much to learn. That's what I love yeah. about photography though. You know, oh, yeah. it's a lifetime's pursuit, isn't it? Yeah. Do you print stuff at all or do you look at stuff on screens mostly? Screens 90% of the time. But I had a chat right. with um, the, the gent in there who was, was created the whole thing. And he's like, I'm going to message you some printer advice because it changes everything when you can mm. see it and see how colors are rendered, not through the influence of screens. So, yeah, that's on my to do list. Yeah, I think that and books. Dan Milner, who was on a previous episode, is a creative evangelist at Blurb and it's the thing he tries to drill into people, I think, more than anything, is to like handle your work and look at prints and look at, you know, like really, because you, you can't hide once it's printed. And his his thing is all like proper photographers print stuff and like, you know, other ones are just scared of it. Seeing things big, it's such an interesting thing because there is once or twice where I'm posting something on Instagram and I'm like, people are seeing this in 1080p on a mobile phone. They won't notice yeah. that piece of rubbish in the corner or something. <laughs> And then if it was on like an A3 print, it would just be glaringly obvious. <laughs> Do you like to remove stuff like that, though? Because increasingly, and maybe it's a, a an age laziness thing as well, but increasingly I want to just leave that stuff in. It was just, it was there, you know? Yeah, I think it depends on, on the story you're trying to tell. Like if it's street photography and, and it's a very candid sort of moment in time that you're capturing, then yes, leave flaws and all in. Mm. But I think if you have something that's otherwise just, blooming perfect and there's just one distraction that doesn't serve the story i'm not a purist get rid of it get rid of it yeah it can go it's it fine go. once you're yeah. scanning once you're scanning your own developed negatives yeah you know then yeah. i have to stick I'll, I'll be tidying up the scenes and thinking <laughs> a little bit more consciously yeah well i guess on that what is your 
edit process because there's lots of talk of like people use tablets and people use desktops and people are like what's your preferred kind of workflow for this sort of thing what do you like to do so when I did um, weddings a lot of the time, I did use an iPad Pro extensively. Mm. It was just so handy to have the smart previews on the iPad. You could do it when you're traveling. You could do it in your hotel room. And, you know, it's quite monotonous and, and repetitive doing sort of wedding stuff. So, like, tablets for that, I think, is great. But for what I do at the moment, I've got, like, a dual monitor set up. Mm. Um, one's, like, a matte screen and one's my apple oled which i think is actually really accurate for the colors i do Mm. i do i do highly rate them for that um so yeah editing on laptop with two screens for reference and then i will send it to my phone just to double check yeah because screens are a little bit tricky aren't they they show things in a different way sometimes no they definitely do i mean the color temperature can change a lot especially when they're adaptive like modern screens that can adapt to like it means when you actually look at it in some other way you're like oh no that's that's just wrong that just doesn't look right at all but yeah that's really interesting that you've kind of got the reference thing going on as well that's it's because it's key isn't it i guess especially if you're making a preset exactly it's got to look the same for everyone yeah so the 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 way that i went into that i probably went a little bit too nerdy into it but i found a website online where people can donate uh, raw files and it's free for people to download and test so i downloaded over 200 raw files all different cameras all different sensor sizes and tested them on everything just to make sure that no matter what you're coming from it would be worth your while oh wow that's cool yeah. that must have been did you ever do a video about that because that no. seems like that would be I probably I mean, should, shouldn't I? I should shout well, about that a little bit more. <laughs> that's because that's awesome. That like that's tested because Dave, like Dave Herring, does a bunch of presets and stuff as well. And like he's made a point of like we shot thousands of images, we looked at all these things. He's done these little videos where he shows how you use it, but also how you have to tweak it. Right? That like you can't just expect, yeah. you, you know, because every environment is different, every photo is different. If you're not if you're using a lot of presets, you're probably also setting your camera to some sort of automatic thing. So like, even if it's just white balance, like that will affect the difference from one image to the other. Like that's another thing I don't understand fully that I feel like I need to understand that I should be manually setting my white balance for consistency and things like that. I think there's a there's a journey to go on. But yeah, that, that's really cool. Do you think that would overlap with your kind of gear, like the popular video types, you know, if you were to do something like that? Or is it is it just a bit too inside baseball i think it may be worth doing a little video uh origin of my presets on my website just to show how much work went into them and how much i do use them all the time Uh, but it is one of those things on my youtube channel it's like my immediate thought was that that would not do very well because you know it's not new shiny camera it's not this changes everything Is that lurking in the back of your mind? It's like every all video has to be, your mouth has to be open in the thumbnail. You have to have big eyes. Like it's, it's all those things, isn't it? It's the Mr. Yeah. Beast stuff. I love giving uh, photography advice first and foremost. Like I do, mm. um, I, I was an online tutor during uh, COVID, oh, wow. uh, doing face-to-face workshops, things like that. I love seeing beginners progress. And working with a lot of beginners, you do see the same simple mistakes over and over Mm. again. And I would love nothing more than to give people advice. But if I did seven tips for beginners, it would get no views. So I liken it to um, trying to feed children vegetables. You've got to hide it Ah. in in nice packaging. And so it might be I might go on a photo walk with this shiny, cool camera that's only 200 pounds. Oh, by the way, here is some tips while I'm here. And I'll try and do it that way. nice i feel like seeing the workings now that's what i'm going to be looking out for in the future videos is the is the way is the point in the video where it it turns and you're like you can have dessert but you gotta eat your broccoli first that's it yeah this is it if you want to do this here's some tips no that's really nice but it is a shame it does speak to that algorithmic challenge doesn't it of just Mm -hmm. how does this thing get found and how does it get surfaced because you know, even with loads of people that I follow, like I sometimes have it, some, especially thinking about the show, right? And like who who I can talk to, you know, as I'm working through my kind of index card file in the back of my brain of like, who should I talk to next? You do suddenly think, I haven't seen that person come up in my feed in a while. And it's just because at some point you were watching some other types of things and then you just didn't see as many of them and they seem to be getting pushed down. I yeah. think that's kind of the worst thing with the software world we live in is the semi-automated like you can't weight the scales you know youtube very rarely says to you as a as a user as a viewer you know what do you want do you want more of that it surveys you in different ways so yeah it's 
it's a bit tricky, really. It is. And that's why a mailing list is so good, because perhaps mm. those people want the advice over the razzle dazzle. So you can have a more direct conversation with people in your inbox sometimes versus yeah. it being thrown out to people who may not know who you are on YouTube. Yeah. Who are you watching a lot of at the moment when you're, I mean, do you watch a lot or is it a bit of too much of a busman's holiday? You'd be like, no, actually when I've done my stuff, I go and look out a window and make jigsaws. I go through phases. Sometimes it's the last thing I want to do and I look mm -hmm. at completely different content. Um, but there's so many talented people in the photography niche. I really love watching uh, street photographers. I love George Holden's channel for that. I think he's mm -hmm. got a great mixture of interesting uh, insights into technology as well as he goes out and does street photography. And yeah. I went on a photo walk with him recently and the way that he can just unashamedly just take street portraits he says you know ask for forgiveness rather than permission like right. i'm very much a wallflower when it comes to my street yeah. photography i get lots of backs of people's heads because i'm a chicken and he's just like oh i love your hair click and just gets an amazing street portrait so cool yeah. I, I i need to I'm, I'm toying with the idea of like doing a video where it's like i took you know street portraits close-up street portraits for a mm. month here's what i learned and just yeah. the absolute cringe and the pain that i would go through but i think it would yeah. make me a better photographer by the end of it because it's those moments that haunt you when you see yeah. something and you haven't captured it correctly because you've been too hesitant it's yeah. much worse than as you say the worst that they could say is can you delete that please yeah what was the last thing that you learned that made you uncomfortable like that with photography that kind of put you in that kind of but you knew was making you better so one one thing I did as a precursor to being a wedding photographer was I did family shoots in people's homes. So I would go with like a little portable backdrop, portable lights. And I remember sitting in the car just panicking, thinking, oh, I've got to go in there and set up my lights and make a good impression. And I just forced myself to do it over and over and over until I learnt my lighting inside out. I was very personable. I could go in and say hi to everyone, get everyone where they need to be. And it was such a trial by fire but i think that set me up for being very personable when meeting couples for wedding clients and, and and meeting other client work in future so sometimes you've really got to push yourself even if it feels hideous yes um, because it makes you better in the long run do you know when we had our first son one of the other parents at the nct group asked uh if i'd take some photos of their baby after he'd been born because i kept talking about cameras so i went and i did it and there was just like you're describing there, because I'm not pro, like I wasn't, you know, but I went in and I was getting some photos of Archie and he's lying on the ground doing different things. And for the first 15 minutes, his dad was very like, I'm not sure about this. And then I got some photos and started to show them the photos. And I knew it was working when after about 15, 20 minutes, he came over and went, do you want a beer? Yeah. And I just, <laughs> I knew I'd been accepted at that point. And I was like, God, no, I might mess up the photos of your kid. I don't think I've got it yet, but thank you. Like that was, yeah. that was the moment. <laughs> Can't imagine kind of trying to do that a lot. For oh people. yeah. It, it was, it was not fun, but it got me a lot of contacts to set up my wedding business. So it was yeah. a good stepping stone, but I would not, I would have to be in a very bad position in life to do that again. It was very stressful. <laughs> It is funny how you talk to people. Kevin Mullins, who was on a previous episode as well, was that big wedding guy. And he was talking about the relief. You could sense the relief when, when you listen to that episode of like, yeah, I've only got one left. Yeah. <laughs> he was just so pleased. It's like, I never have to do that again. Never have to kind of lug all that gear to a wedding, worry about the fact the lens I need is in the car, that kind yeah. of thing. It's such yeah. a long, long day. And yeah. the, de the day doesn't stop at the wedding day. You've got oh, yeah. so much leading up to it. You've got so much after. It's a lot of admin, a lot of juggling, a lot of keeping everyone happy. When you're in it and you're looking for bookings and it's it's exciting mm. and you're thinking, oh, my calendar's booked up for the summer. This is amazing. It's great. But then when you're actually in the trenches, mm. it's so hard. Like. However mm. hard people think weddings may be, I think it's harder. You have to yeah. be about 25 different photographers. You go from action photography to portrait photography to candid photography yeah. uh, to details and macro. You know, you've got to wear yeah. so many hearts. It's crazy. Mm. I shot one once. It was for my sister-in-law when she was getting married. And um, I took a Polaroid as a, on a whim. Just as a, like literally two days before the thing, I was like, um, the Polaroid I won. Uh, or the impossible I won as it was, um, was on Amazon for like 50 quid. And so on a bit of a whim, 
I was like, I'll buy one of those. I'll buy some film and I'll take some Polaroids and they'll be fun in the book. Like when we do the book, it'll just be fun to have a couple of Polaroids. And I accidentally took the most beautiful Polaroid I've ever made. The, just everything, because it's a fully automatic camera. So I can't f take any credit for it whatsoever. I just pointed it and pressed the button and the sun was incredible and the film stock just worked. And then Emily, you've got that moment where you're like, I'm in the middle of nowhere with no cell reception. And I have the one copy of this perfect photograph and I must not lose it. Like, how am I going to, what am I going to do with this one picture? And I remember I put it in a box and I was just like, I told Alice, my wife, I was just like, put that in the glove box and we cannot lose that. Like if the, if the car gets stolen overnight, like whatever, just for God's sake, don't lose that picture. So I can, I, I was like, I think I can retire from wedding photography. Yeah, having, you've peaked, you've done it. You've having got played, your main shot. <laughs> exactly. I've played at it once. I need never go back there again. Um, but is there any uh, kind of event type thing that you would like to do that you haven't done, I guess? Because you've traveled, you must have ticked a few YouTube photography person, like create a bucket list items, right? You've traveled to Japan for like camera launches. You've done safari, it sounds like. Like what else, what's left on the list? Oh, I, I just love um, meeting people that I've watched for years and years and years um like caleb pike uh, mm -hmm. on dslr video shooter um i've watched his videos for years and years and years met him in, in japan in uh for the g for the s52 and then he came over right. to england with his lovely wife and asked if if i could do some portraits of them so i took them on a little photo shoot around york and um it's just mad to think like mm. These people I've watched and learned all of my mm. own skills from. Like I probably bought the GH5 because of Caleb, which changed right. my life entirely. Yeah. And now sometimes I'm in the same room with them and having the same conversations and being sat at the ta same table. It's just yeah. mad. It's really cool. Oh, well, that's wonderful. That's really good. I, I do. I think it's a treat. I think it's the, the reason to start something like this. Like the super secret reason for doing any of this stuff is that like if you enjoy it, then getting to meet people that you, you know not heroes necessarily but like people you really admire right like that's the thing it's like if i can spend an hour talking to someone whose videos i really like and learn about a new camera system like that's what a treat like i almost don't care if anyone looks at it you know yeah. like it just that's just the best like so it's like people who do movies isn't it like this one's for me you know yeah. you've got to do something yeah. for you as well as for everyone else well you're being very generous with your time so thank you but what is your we haven't we haven't touched on a lens for at least 15 minutes okay so Lens number three, serious face. Okay. What was lens number three? Because I think um, when you sent me the email, you had the first one, maybe the second. Yeah, I want to do a curveball for this one and go okay. back to full frame. While we've been talking about weddings a little oh. bit, my favorite portrait lens of all time is the Sigma 85mm f1.4. Oh, it nice. is delightful you cannot take a i'm convinced you cannot take a bad photograph of people with that lens the only downside is it is quite big so i right. have subsequently do you remember what i said earlier every time i sell something i regret it mm -hmm. i sold it for the lumix 1.885 because it's half the weight half the size yeah but there is just something special just shooting wide open in yep. in oh that 85 is so good i'm gonna have to try and find it again one day i think yeah what which body was that on was that on a canon so i was shooting that with the original s5 and the s1 ah, right. the first okay. full frames yeah, yeah. and then the s5 two um and the 2x now oh, nice that that sounds dreamy and delicious and i think if you've got those ones this that your response there when remembering that lens and so you were almost misty-eyed like yeah. is, is exactly the reason for these conversations and as someone who sold his dream lens at a certain point loved it and then regretted it even though there's nothing you know particularly remarkable about it i just love it to bits yeah you might have to i might encourage you to go and find that do they still make that lens they do yes there, there was okay. um so there is the, that yeah, the Sigma range confuses me. There's an older version, the DG, and then the newer mm -hmm. versions are the DN, I think. Right. And it's the newer version that has the better autofocus, et cetera. So, yeah, very, very nice. Yeah, that's very good. D just keep an eye on it, I guess, until it goes out of production. And if they ever stop, just grab one quick. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's the worst feeling in the world is when they stop making something and then suddenly the price goes up. Like anyway. the Olympus Pen F, my first Micro Four yeah. Thirds camera that I sold. And 
the, the price has just skyrocketed and I just can't bring myself to buy it again because I'm a cheapskate, but I so regret selling it. Yeah. Do you find, um, like, that it, I don't know what drives the changes sometimes in the price. You know the way they're so volatile. Like, sometimes you can look at something, like, I'm, I'm scared to say it out loud because I feel like it's tempting the universe, but, like, I was looking at M5 bodies because the M5 Leica is, like, the one that... It's like Timothy Dalton's Aston Martin in that Bond film. It's like, nobody loves that one, but somehow it's also the coolest because it's so different. Yeah. And I was looking at those and bodies for those at one point could be had for about a thousand pounds because no one cared. Right. And now they're going up. Now they're like two, three. Do you want a boxed one? That'll be four. And I'm like, well, that's M6 money. Like now yeah. you're getting into kind of, and actually it won't have been manufactured in 1975. So it might actually still work, you know, if we went for something newer, but it won't look cool like that one. I don't know what, I don't know what pushes it. I don't know what the ebb and flow is. In the mm. matrix I, I think there's so few units on the used market for most mm. cameras that it only takes one blog post or one youtube video to shine right. a spotlight on something and suddenly yeah. it's all gone and then someone yeah. goes on and goes wow the last one of these sold for like 700 pounds i'm gonna put it on for a thousand and then it just goes up and up and up yeah i get comments all the time on slightly older videos where it's like you said this was 200 pounds and now it's 500 pounds i'm like it's also only came out like seven years ago and there's about yeah. three of them on the used market <laughs> what do you yeah. want from me <laughs> exactly it was it was all right at the time like yeah. it, it's like you have to put that caveat on everything you're just yeah. like in 2020 this was all right i didn't know there was gonna be a pandemic around the corner and suddenly everything was gonna kick off that's it i got the Leica um type 701 the mm -hmm. silver one mm -hmm. um for like 358 pounds oh, just wow. before christmas and, and i'm looking at it now i made a video and it did all mm. right it's, it's got a couple i think it's like sixty thousand views which is more than enough to dry up the used market yes for it, unfortunately. Yeah. so now it's it's like creeping up to a thousand pounds again and it's nice and it's a leica but my goodness yeah that was a yeah it's ridiculous i hope it goes back down yeah, we had that. Some friends of ours sent me some old cameras that they had kicking around because I was asking for some for the boys because I've got a little boys, one's six and one's 10 nearly. And so a friend sent me a, a Fuji, I think it's the X10. Mm. So it's an integrated, brilliant little camera, fantastic. And I looked it up just out of interest and trying to get one of those used, which is the right kind of camera to give to a kid who's interested in photography because it's a proper camera, they'll learn some things. They're like 400 quid. It's like, this thing's 12 years old. It's it's not that it's bad, but it's definitely not great anymore. Yeah. You know, you know, phones phones eclipse it in a bunch of ways. But yeah, it just seems unreasonable. I mean, now it's sitting on the floor behind me. It's now covered in Polaroid Go stickers, <laughs> so it's it's fully owned and bashed up in a way that you know is wonderful. I'll, I'll send you a picture afterwards of my little boy holding it, like using it. He looks like a proper little photo gangster. It's hilarious. Like I've got these little photos. He's just, he's sort of holding it with it around his neck, looking around. It's, it's very cool. That's Especially so now it's covered in stickers. Yes. Well, you yeah, know, they're my kids. So they're going to be a little bit camera obsessed, you know, which is quite nice. Got yeah. to be done. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you can't infect those around you with a love of cameras, then uh, what's the point of doing it at all? That's right. it. I, I often go uh, on photography walks with my dad. He was always a massive landscape photographer when I was very young and he dragged me to all these places and I would just think it was the most boring thing ever. Uh -huh. And now I've grown up to be exactly like him. <laughs> We're going to the Faroe Islands again um, together oh, cool. for a photography holiday this, this month um, to shoot the puffins, which is very exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, really cool. Was he the big camera influence on you growing up or were there other members of the family? Were there other people like showing you photography? He was the, the only person in the family who was big on it. And it was sort of like, it was a little bit, you know, he, he had he had slideshows for his, his landscape um, photography and we'd sit through them. And now I'm so interested in it. And I'm like, I was such an obnoxious child to not like take it seriously at the time. But yeah, now we can enjoy it together. That's really nice, though. I think it's lovely that you kind of can see it now. Like, I, I try and get the boys interested in this, or at least let them see the stuff that, that we're interested in. Because I think also, like, my, my mum passed away when I was very young, and it was just at the point when I was realising she was a person. Mm. 
And so I want them to understand that like we have interests beyond just being parents because the, then they'll start to realize they live with humans, not people who are just saying no to all the fun stuff that they want to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's a danger. You just become the person who says, no, eat your greens. No, put your socks on, you know, and so, yeah, try and kind of show them all the cool stuff we're into. It's why we moved to the Highlands is so that we've got somewhere we can live where you can fall off your bicycle without being run over, but it's just boring enough that they'll go and find stuff like when they're when they're a teenager and they're like you suck dad you know they'll go and find their own thing no that's yeah. amazing that's a great place to grow up not bad hey if you're ever passing let me know we can go and you know i can show you some hills around here let me tell you bring your dad bring a tripod it can be a whole thing i'll make some pizza afterwards it'd be great yeah sounds great i'm in <laughs> yeah cool well Thank you so much. Look, you, it was really, really good to talk to you. I really enjoyed this. It's, it's another person like whose videos I watch. I can tick off and go, yeah, I've spoken to Emily. Know who she is. Um, and, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully it was fun. Um, is there anywhere you want to point anyone before we kind of wrap things up? Yeah. So I do a free monthly photo contest and there's cameras up for grabs it's sponsored by some really nice brands you can always get some really nice prizes uh, there's a, a lumix premium compact which is the first prize for june mm -hmm. uh, all you need to do is join the mailing list and then join in the fun there's a free critique video and it, yeah we're getting a lovely little community outside of youtube over there so it's really fun to see and oh, you can lovely. do that at microphone <laughs> Excellent. A good a good URL read as well. I'll stick it in the show notes so people have got it at the end uh, and they can go and find all your all your goings on and sign up to the newsletter. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks so much for doing this. I really enjoyed it. And um, I will, yeah, let us know if you're in the Highlands yes, or just come and see us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I'm always up for talking about nerdy camera things. <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. Um, cool. Well, have a lovely rest of the day. I'll see you soon. Awesome. Cheers. You can rate and review this series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and that'll help people to find the show. You can also sign up for a midweek newsletter that I've started doing. You can get that at ianfarrell.com slash sign dash up, and there is a link to it in the show notes as well. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.